Matthew chapter 1, and what, what we're going to do here, Lord willing, is we're going to begin to take a look at the book of Ruth. And I don't mean a detailed verse by verse because, well, Sunday morning class needs to be kind of flexible. But um, we, we want to take a look at the book of Ruth, but I want to do it from a little different perspective, and we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1 to do so. Okay? All right, before we get going, let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Father, thank you for your incredible mercy and your grace and your love and your patience with us. Lord, thank you for overlooking our worldliness, our lukewarmness, our, our slackness, our laziness, our dullness, everything that we're guilty of, Lord. Thank you for looking at your Son, Jesus Christ, in our place. Thank you for giving us a way and a means to come unto you, not through our own works, otherwise we could never come. Lord, thank you for paving the way that is perfect and in righteous and in all righteousness in Christ and through your Spirit. And Father, we thank you for this incredible gift. Otherwise, we would be eternally cut off from you and never be able to know you. So we thank you above all things for our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. In Matthew chapter 1, I just want to start here. Now, the book of Matthew and the book of Luke each start with a genealogy. And there's some differences in them, and it's not because there's errors, it's because it's looking at two different lines, okay? He had a mother and a father. Well, he had an, an earthly father by all perception under the law, and then he had an earthly mother. But here in Matthew, we've got the lineage, and it's going to go back to Joseph. And really, this is the lineage of the king. And it starts, it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, in saying that, what Matthew's done is he's taken in both the great covenants, hasn't he? The covenant of David promising a king, and then the covenant of Abraham promising the seed. Is Jesus Christ the promised seed? And is He the promised king? So here it's going to it. It says, Abraham begat Isaac. Notice it doesn't go all the way back to Adam. Now in Luke, dealing with his fleshly lineage from Mary, it goes all the way back to Adam. But here we're talking about the covenant promises, so it goes to Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Tamar, and uh, Phares begat Ezram. By the way, Tamar, what was Tamar? Mm -hmm. She played a harlot, didn't she? You go yeah. back there and read it. She played a harlot, and there she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ, in his royal lineage. It says, Phares begat Ezram, Ezram begat Aram, Aram begat Amenadab, Amenadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon. And the Jewish tradition says that Salmon was one of the two spies that went in. Remember when they sent two spies into Jericho? Mm -hmm. Well, it makes sense then what we read next. And Salmon beget, it looks like booze here, it's Boaz. Mm -hmm. Boaz of Rahab. Now, do you all remember who Rahab was? Mm -hmm. Rahab the harlot, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that get mad that she's called a harlot in the Scripture. I thank God for it. Because it gives me a uh, security in knowing that God saved that harlot, didn't He? Salvation ain't based on our morality, is it? So it says, Salmon beget Boaz of Rahab. Then who married Rahab? Salmon, and according to the Jews, one of the two spies. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? One of those two spies that she hid and protect wound up marrying. <coughs> but anyway, here's Rahab, the harlot, and it says, Boaz beget Obed of Ruth. And of Obed, we get Jesse, and of course, Jesse David. But who is Ruth then? Ruth the Moabitess. Now, I'd like to ask y'all a question. How did two harlots and a Moabite, cursed of God, get into the lineage of Jesus Christ? Because God said that that's the way it's going to be. Thank you. Mr. Bailey's God. <laughs> Class adjourned. God said, this is what I'm going to do, didn't He? What we're going to talk about today is the providence of God. And when I say providence, I mean God has a plan and He's carrying that plan out, didn't He? Now here, in the lineage of Jesus Christ, we've got two harlots. Who in the world would list a harlot in your genealogy? We don't, you know, that's not normal according to earthly ways, is it? He, I was listening to two of my sisters talk, and one of them said her kid had to do a, uh, my, my nephew had to do a family tree and started researching the family tree. And as soon as she said it, the other one said, whoa, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. And said, so what do you mean? She said, you're going to find out some stuff you ain't going to want to hear. And sure enough, it's there, right? And um, it, matter of fact, I met another lady. I've told you all recently that I met a lady through, through YouTube who was just, you know, struggling with salvation. And she turned out to be my third cousin from over in Gulfport. 
she got saved and come to find out she's my third cousin and on top of that one of the first things she mentions is well you kind of know about our family don't you <laughs> i said yeah i've heard some things going back there's some there's some bad stuff there but my sister told my other sister look don't do it just take the family name clemens and start with mark twain and go from there because my grandpa claims we're, we're kin to mark twain samuel clemens but what she was telling her is you don't want to put all that other stuff in your official genealogy now, you know, that's just a fancy way of saying you don't want to bring shame on our name, right? Now, is Jesus Christ's lineage here as the royal king listed? Yes. And we've got two harlots and a cursed Moabite. And one more time, how did they get into the lineage of Jesus Christ? Mr. Bailey? Pardon? How did they get there? Because God said. Because God said so. God did it. Okay, this is what we want to talk about. Now, I'm going to give you all a little uh, background on the book of Ruth. Uh, if we were to draw a timeline, I personally draw one usually to help me. I'm a visual kind of a person. But anyway, if we drew a timeline here, in our Bible we've got Israel's history books. You've got the Law of Moses first and then Judges, but then you've got Israel's what they call their history books. And it's interesting how they group them. It starts out with the book of Ruth. Now there's only two books in the Bible... Tell James she's right on time. <laughs> There's only two books in the Bible that are named after women. Rooster. Rooster. <laughs> <laughs> you see my genealogy, I'm telling you something wrong here. Ruth and Esther, right? And the way the Jews grouped them and the way they're in our Bible for sure is Ruth is at the beginning of Israel's history books and Esther's at the end. And I'm going to put them up here not as they appear in the Bible but as they appear in history because what they do is they show us something. Ruth and Esther. Okay. Now back here they appear like this. But what I want to show you all is what they typify. They typify something wonderful. I'm going to come right here after the cross and I'm going to put Ruth and then I'm going to come way down here to the end, and I'm going to put Esther. <coughs> now, Ruth is the story of how scattered Jews went out into the world and a Gentile got saved. That's the story of Ruth. What happened after the cross? The Jews were scattered, and the same thing. Gentiles started to come into the family of God. But Esther is just the opposite, isn't it? Esther's the story of how a Jewish woman who didn't even tell anybody she was Jewish, it was hid from the world, got saved under the dominion and realm of a Gentile king and saved her people, didn't she? And what did we, we just recently talked about what Romans 11 says. Is there a great uh, bulk of Jewish people that are going to be saved before the end? Mm -hmm. So it shows us the beginning and end of the gospel, how it lays out. But here it is back here in history. Okay, so that's Ruth. Now, we're told that Ruth, once again, was a Moabitess. Okay? Now this was written, the book of Ruth was written in David's time, probably, because it lists David's genealogy. It takes it to David. The Jews say it was written by Samuel, and that may be. I don't know that you can prove it, but it doesn't matter. So that, that's the timeline of it. And in verse 1, it tells us it would happen during the time of the Judges. Now if you all remember what the time of the Judges was, uh, let's just come over here and say, Let's say, here's God's call of Abraham. Okay? God calls Abraham and the people wind up in bondage in Egypt. I'll just put Egypt here. And then God calls Moses to deliver them. And Moses redeems the people and delivers them. And after 40 years in the wilderness, we have them finally going into the land under Joshua. And that would be the next book after Moses. Joshua. And once Joshua gets them in the land... The people basically did what God said and followed Joshua and that older generation. But when that generation died, the next book is Judges. They didn't have kings yet. God gave them judges to judge Israel. And it says in the time of Judges that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now if you read the book of Judges, what you've got is Israel obeying God and conquering the land. Israel turning to idols and, and falling under oppression. And back and forth they go. They're enslaved, they're freed. They're enslaved, they're freed. Did they ever learn their lesson? No. Well, Ruth takes place during that time. So that's when it takes place. Now, we need to establish something about these Moabites. What in the world is a Moabite? It's a descendant of Moab. 
Okay? Does everybody know who Moab was? They probably not. When Abraham got called, Abraham came out of the Ur of the Chaldees and he brought somebody with him, didn't he? He brought several people with him, but one of them was his nephew named Lot. And Lot comes out with Abraham. Lot at one point chose, he, he, they had to split up because their cattle were too many and it was, was causing problems. So Abraham says to Lot, choose which, which side you want and you take it and I'll take the other. Just trusting God to bless him in it. And Lot looked out there and chose with his eyes, didn't he? And he said, I'll take that real fertile, pretty land. And he went over there. Now what did that turn out to be? The land of what? Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah. And Lot lived among Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're told that Lot vexed his righteous soul. So Lot was righteous then, wasn't he? We know he was because when God was going to destroy Sodom, Abraham pleaded, is there any righteous there? And God had to get Lot out, didn't he? But how did it affect Lot's uh, walk with the Lord living in Sodom? It vexed him. What's it mean to be vexed? Sure no? Torn Mr. apart. Torn apart? Sure. Yeah. Vexed is to bring a curse upon yourself. Vexed is to bring harm upon yourself. Like, you know, we would say someone put a hex on you. It's not so much like that as it is he cursed his own soul. I don't mean he damned himself. A man can't do that if he's saved. What I mean is, did he cost himself dearly by living there? Yeah. He did. He should have got out of there, shouldn't he? But he didn't. He lived there. And when he lived there, he had uh, daughters. Now, his daughters marry some men. And we know what the men of Sodom were, what their issue was. You read later that their daughters' husbands are involved in the story, and it refers to the daughters still as virgins, doesn't it? Now, that tells you something about their husbands. We know that there was a horrible place to live and they just turned from God. It was idol. It was idolatry. It was a horrible place. But when he leaves out of there, you remember his wife wanted to go back. She turns back and God turned her to a pillar of salt. Him and his two daughters leave and they see Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed from above. Look, for every intent and purpose, they thought they were the last three people on earth. I mean, it, volcanoes, hailstorm, whatever it was, wiped it out. They can't find it today. They've looked and looked and looked and can't find it. One man claims he's found it under the Dead Sea. I don't know if that's true or not, but the point is God said, I'll destroy it and it'll never be again. And it's funny to me, archaeologists say Sodom and Gomorrah is a fairy tale because they can't find it. The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah, and if it was real, we could find it. And yet the Bible says, no, I'm going to destroy it and you won't be able to find it. So the very fact that they can't find it proves the, the Scripture. But when they're leaving, they go up into a mountain to live. And he's wanting to go to a city. Lots of guys that's gotten, he's, he's real worldly. But to make a long story short, they're in a cave there and the two daughters get him drunk and they sleep with him. Y'all remember the story, right? And that produces one son named Moab and one son named Ammon. And that's where the Moabites and the Ammonites come from. Now, who is going to be a thorn in Israel's side all their life? Moab and Ammon, the Moabites and the Ammonites, okay? So when we get to this story, we get to a group of people, the Moabites, of who Ruth is one, that come from cursed beginnings because they come from the worst kind of sin. I mean, an incestuous relationship, condemned under the law, wasn't it? So they started out as a cursed <coughs> people. What are they throughout the Scripture? Folks, they're a cursed people. I'll just give you some examples. Um, the Moabites came from cursed beginnings. They worship the false god Chemosh, according to the scripture. And do y'all remember how they honored Chemosh? What they sacrificed? Their children. Yeah, those that are, the Ammonites worship Moloch, and both of them gave their babies as sacrifices. Um, I mean, that's horrible, isn't it? But you know, there's similar things being done today in the names of different idols. I mean, look in our country, it happens, doesn't it? We, we, we human beings are sinners, and there's no end to our sin. But Ammon and Mo, uh, Moab. Now Moab is cursed. Hey, they offer uh, their children to the god uh, Chemosh. In Numbers 22 and 25, Israel encounters Moab. And everybody remembers the story of Balak and Baal, don't we? What did Moab do to Israel at that time? Did they aid them and help them as God's people? No, they sought to curse them. They hired a false prophet and wanted to destroy them. This is a people that had a cursed beginning and they'd done nothing in their life to deserve anything other than cursing. Can you think of one redeemable trait in Moab? Not in the Bible. Not one, is there? 
So this is the Moabites. Now in Isaiah 15 and 16, God renews the curse upon Moab. God says they're cursed. And when you get to uh, chapter 16, God gives them three more years to repent. What does that tell us about God's curse? Was there room for repentance? Yeah. Yeah. There was, but they didn't repent. In Jeremiah 48, Moab is cursed of God and appointed to destruction. It says they rejected God in arrogance. Moab, it says, is at ease. I want you all to turn over to 48.11. Jeremiah 48.11. And y'all bear with me just to establish some of this history so we, we've got a real grip of what a Moabite is. Now, who do y'all think the Moabites were a type or a picture of? Cursed from their birth and having not a single redeemable quality. Who's that sound like? Folks, that's me. Yeah. Cursed from my birth as a sinner and having nothing in me that warrants salvation. Now, can y'all see what a Moabite was in the Scripture? It's a type of us, isn't it? It's very simple. Now, in uh, Jeremiah 48, Jeremiah is bringing down the hammer on Moab. But I want you all to look what he says about them in verse uh, 10. Jeremiah 48, 10. This is all against Moab. He says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Moab hath been at ease from his youth. Now, what's it mean to be at ease? Have they had any hard times? Hey, Y'all know, literally, we could say America has been at her e at ease since her birth, hadn't she? We've had no real wars here. I mean, the Civil War, but for the most part, we've been a country that's been at ease. Well, it says, Moab hath been at ease from his youth. He hath been settled on his leads, and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel. Neither hath he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste remained in him, and his scent is not changed. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll send unto him wanders, and shall cause him to wander, and empty his vessels, and break their bottles, and he goes on from there. But I just wanted to use this to get us started on something. What does he mean to go from vessel to vessel? Are you all familiar with how they made wine back then? Has anybody ever read anything about it? Remember Jesus talked about you can't put new wine in old bottles? First thing when wine, when you make wine, it's got the yeast causes it to ferment. So it, it bubbles, it expands. So they would make bottles out of leather. Well, leather has a certain amount of stretch to it, doesn't it? So you put new wine in this leather bottle, and the gas gives off and leather stretches. Now, that leather has now stretched all it can stretch. If you turn around and come back and put new wine in that bottle again, it's going to bust. So that's how they would let the wine expand. But what he's talking about here is the way that they remove the dregs, the, the, the particles, the ferment, the pulp, I guess you would call it. He, they, would, they would let it expand and the dregs would settle. They would pour it from that vessel into another vessel. It would ferment and go and they'd leave the... In other words, to pour from vessel to vessel is to keep refining the wine and making it purer and purer and better and better. That's why they talk about new wine being so good. And what it's basically referring to is the process by which God sanctifies His people. How does God sanctify or how does God refine our faith? By testing it. Folks, we're put into one test and trial after another. We're poured from vessel to vessel in order to do what? To get the drags out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now he says, Moab has remained just as he always ever was from his birth because he's never been poured from vessel to vessel. So literally, what's that telling us? God has not dealt with Moab in any way as far as purifying them, cleansing them. God has left them just as they were from their cursed beginnings. They're a cursed people. And every time they come up in Scripture, what do you find out about them? They're cursed. They're cursed, causing trouble. They're causing trouble for God's people. So this is the Moabite. Now, uh, just to show you some others, Ezekiel condemns Moab. Amos condemns Moab. And in Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah condemns them when they come back into the land and build the temple again, over here. When they come back and they rebuild their temple, do you remember what they did? They married into the people again, didn't they? Why did God forbid the Israelites from marrying into the people? He said, you know, it drew them away from God. Yeah, it pulled you away from God. He, Solomon's the supreme example, isn't he? Solomon had all those different women, and what did it cause Solomon to do? Worship their idols. He turned from God and worshiped idols, didn't he? 
So God told the Israelites not to marry into Moab. And when they rebuilt the temple, when Nehemiah comes back into town, he looks around and he says, wait a minute. They get out the book of the law and they start reading it. And it says, a Moabite shall not come into the congregation of the Lord. We're going to read that in a minute. They're cursed. Nehemiah looks up and what does he see? A bunch of Moabites. So what does Nehemiah do? He starts cleaning house, getting rid of the Moabites. They're cursed. Okay, that, That's the picture. Now, um, let's go to Deuteronomy uh, 23. In Deuteronomy 23, I just want to show you all the grand pronouncement of the curse upon them. You know, it's a fascinating thing to go through a study of the Old Testament and look at how the prophecies were fulfilled in the history. It's just, there's so many intricate details there that no man, had hit, no man could ever put this together like this. And Deuteronomy 23 is a good example. 23? Yeah, Deuteronomy 23. It says, He that is wounded in the stones. I don't need to get vivid. Y'all know what that means. I hope. <laughs> or half his privy member cut off. We're talking about a eunuch. Okay? This is a eunuch. He shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Could a eunuch come into the congregation of the Lord? No. Now, does that mean there were no eunuchs around? No. There were eunuchs around, but were they part of the covenant? No, they weren't part of Moses' covenant. He said, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even unto the tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. You know what a bastard is? Mm -hmm. What is it? Born out of wedlock. Born out of covenant. A, a bastard is someone that's born out of covenant. They say a bastard is someone that has no father, but folks, there's no such yeah, thing. Okay. Everybody yeah. has a father. Right. A bastard is someone that doesn't know their father or it doesn't have a relationship with their father. What would that be in the congregation of the Lord? Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and that in your name? And what did he tell them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So next he says, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. And the tenth generation here, it might mean literally ten generations, but it probably is using the number ten for the number of... of forever. And that happens under Moses' law quite a bit because Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 13, the Moabites shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. So I just wanted to go through all of that. I didn't mean to bore you, but I wanted to show y'all what a Moabite is. Is there any way a Moabite can get into the congregation of the Lord? No. But I just read to y'all Ruth right there in the genealogy of Christ, didn't I? Yeah. Well, how is she in there? Huh? Christ God, God put her in there. Susan's God and God did it. Alright, let y'all go one more time to uh, Isaiah 56. <clears throat> Everybody can finish this verse I'm fixing to quote. Probably. If you can, I'm, I'm not trying to insult you. But we all are familiar with, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, aren't they? Now, watch what it says in Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, 1. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Did he, did he imply here through uh, Isaiah that there was something coming that was more righteous than what they had known? What is this thing that's always coming that they're always looking for? Folks, it's Christ and the new covenant. It's He in that covenant of salvation. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from His people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. He said, any man that will join himself unto the Lord, if that man be a eunuch, don't call yourself a dry tree anymore and say, oh, woe is me, I'm cut off. If that man's a stranger, don't say, hey, I'm not part of the house of Israel, so I'm not part of God. He said, there's a day coming when don't say these things. Verse 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better 
than of sons and of daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord to be His servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now y'all know over there today, the Jews and the Muslims and, and folks calling themselves Christians are planning a temple, aren't they? A temple for the uh, all monotheistic religions, which basically means uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, and Christians who believe in the one God. And they're planning to build this house, and they say that temple is going to be for all people. Is that the temple the Lord's referring to here? Yeah. Folks, the temple He's referring to is the anti-type of the temple they built back here. Now, Solomon's temple. Can the Gentile go into Solomon's temple? No. Nope. Oh, can the stranger? That's a Gentile. Can the eunuch? Can the Moabite? Under that covenant, could any of those people enter into, into relationship with God? No. But what did he say? He said, look out. Look up. There's a time coming when I'm going to build my real house. And he said, my real house is a spiritual house. And how does he, what does it mean when he says, anybody that joins himself under the Lord will be part of this house? And he said, I'll accept their burnt offerings and their sacrifices. Now, you and I don't offer burnt offerings and sacrifices. What did those represent according to the book of Hebrews? The praise of our lips, the praise of our life, or we worship God, don't we? He said, anybody that turns under the Lord, God's going to have them, isn't he? So, how did Ruth get into the genealogy of Christ? By faith. By faith. By faith. And who knew Ruth before the foundation of the world? God. And when we read, we're going to get in there, we're going to read just four little chapters. We'll read. We probably won't finish it this week, but we're going to read Ruth. And if you can't see the providence and the hand of God, I mean, Ruth goes out to pick, to glean in a field. Folks, that's a form of begging. She went out to go behind them. Hey, y'all know how they just they just took in the cotton up here. Did y'all come out of cotton field up there? Every time I come by there, I think, boy, picking it by hand was better. Don't they leave a lot? Yeah. They leave a lot, don't they? If you were to go behind them as the machine, if you walk behind the machine. I used to uh, have some property up that way when I would bush hog. I don't know what them white birds are. They all in the cow fields. <laughs> you crank up a bush hog and they show up. And as you bush hog, they come right fly behind you and they're picking at the crickets and they... And they're gleaning after you. See, to glean is something that the law of Moses said a stranger could do, or a widow. It was to go behind those that were picking the wheat or the barley and to get anything they missed or dropped. So Ruth is going to wind up needing to glean to eat. She spoke, she starved. Her and her mother-in-law are, are in trouble. And she goes out to glean, and whose property does she just so happen to wind up on? Her near kinsman, Naomi's near kinsman, Boaz. Now, the law is going to say that a near kinsman can redeem by marriage, can he? And everything in the story you see, people today would say, well, that, that's a coincidence. Folks, do you find coincidences in the Word of God? No. No, we find God's providence, don't we? You look back on your life, can't you see it? Mm -hmm. You look back over your life and you can see all your life things happening and we were rebels and, and running against God, but can't you see His hand putting you in situations? Mm -hmm. You know, I think about the places I worked and the way God protected me and kept me and taught me just by the people He put around me. I went into the Navy and the people He put over me. God blessed me all along the way. And all I did was fight and argue with Him. But you know, a little child throws a fit. You don't disown them. You raise them up, don't you? So then, when we get to the story of Ruth, we're going to see the providential hand of God. We're going to see God's sovereignty in doing what He said He was going to do. Now, when did He say to the Son, Ruth is yours? before the foundation of the world. So, over here under Moses' law, could Ruth be his? No way. But y'all know what? Under the law of Moses, who got saved by the law? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Anybody that ever got saved, got saved by grace through faith, didn't they? Mm -hmm. So that's how Rahab got in. That's how uh, Tamar the harlots in the lineage. They're in there by grace through faith. In fact, Rahab is mentioned in the book of Hebrews as acting by faith, didn't she? So, so let's uh, just go on with some of these facts here. But the curse is in place, and unless the people...
turn to God from idols and worship Him, they cannot be saved. Now, how do me and you differ? Man, we don't differ one bit. Folks, we're the exact same. In fact, go to Ephesians 2, and let's see where Paul starts us at. That's it. And they eat bugs. Do they? Oh. Well, they eat crickets and all them bugs, well, too. They probably do yeah. that, too. It's in there. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 2 1. It says, And you hath he quickened, quickened means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus, and he tells them that these believers in Ephesus had been dead, now they're alive. Had they been dead physically? No. no. Spiritually. So Moab is a spiritual picture of us. Moab is spiritual or is physically cursed just like you and I are spiritually cursed. Now who cursed us spiritually? Satan, Satan did through Adam and Eve, through the fall. He says, dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Before a person is saved, before a person is regenerated and brought to God, how do we live? We live just like everybody else. We think we've got our, our own good version of things, but we just live according to the world, how the world lives, don't we? Now, if we continue along that path, where will we go? You'll go right to hell, and that's what we'll be getting what we deserve, won't we? Verse 3 says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now that's a cursed people, isn't it? And that's what me and you are from birth. Thank God for the next two words, but God. Now I want you all to notice what it doesn't say, but you. It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say, but you flipped over a new leaf. But you quit this and you quit that. Now, do we need to flip over a new leaf? And Yeah, folks, we need to turn from all of that. Which one of us can do it? None of us. That's why it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Did God love you because you quit sinning and turned to Him? No. Folks, God loved us while we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved and hath raised us up together spiritually and made us sit together spiritually right now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now we will sit there physically in the future. Right now we're spiritually there. So there we are. We went from a position, if you're saved, from being dead in sins to alive in Christ. Didn't we? Alright, let's go back one book to the left. Galatians and read something in Galatians 3. You know, we have a good friend, many of y'all know her, Miss Ruth from the nursing home in Grand Bay. She was a rocket, a real, real honest to goodness New York rocket. Um, she's got the pictures of it. Man, just a beautiful woman. Hey, Lexi, Ted, they, every so often they'll put a billboard up and show all her old stuff. And I told her one time, I said, boy, look, Miss Ruth. I said, you sure were. Legs. What praying leg kick, you know? I said, boy, I bet the guys wouldn't leave you alone. She went, oh. <laughs> but every time we ever bring it up, I think of Miss Ruth because she fits her name. The name Ruth means pleasant and beautiful. And that she's the nicest woman, isn't she, Lexi? Mm -hmm. But pleasant and beautiful. And every time we go to Ruth, I'll say that. And each time Miss Ruth goes, woo, 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 when I tell her it's pleasant and beautiful. She just loves it. But in Galatians 3, we read this, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now when it says as many as are of the works of the law, he means all those that are trying to gain entry into heaven by the works of the law, by your own works. Any man trying to earn his way into heaven, what is he? Cursed. Curse. He says, for or because it is written in the law, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you want to get to heaven by your works, okay, what kind of work you got to do? The law. The perfect law. 
What happens if you break one one time? You're, you're not perfect. If you break one and you're under that law, you are under the curse of the law. Do you all know what the curse of the law actually said? Let's go on and read it. You can't do it. Absolutely. He says, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for or because it is written in the law, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So if I'm trying to earn my way into heaven and I can't do it, I, my works are not perfect, what do I deserve? I deserve to hang on a tree. And what did my Savior do for me? He hung on a tree for me. He became my curse for me. The best picture of me and you in all the Bible is Barabbas. Barabbas was a criminal, wasn't he? And did Barabbas deserve to hang on the cross? Folks, y'all realize that cross Jesus Christ hung on was prepared for Barabbas. They didn't say, go make me a cross for Jesus. They arrested him in the middle of the night. They went out there. They're going to put Barabbas on that cross, weren't they? And Pilate said, well, surely you'd rather me let Jesus go to this murderer. And what did the Jews say? No. Kill him. So they took Barabbas, didn't get on the cross made for him, and Jesus got on it. Can't y'all see the picture? It's me and you, isn't it? Christ died for me and you. Christ took the curse of the law so that we didn't have to suffer the curse of the law. What would be the worst thing, the most blasphemous thing you could do this morning? Not believe, Not believe that. that. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. Folks, that's the worst sin in the world is to deny the Savior who bought us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now, back over to the thing with the, with the, the curse. How then again could the cursed Moabite just like me and you are cursed sinners, how in the world can we get into God's house? We'll flip over a few books to 1 Thessalonians 1. When Paul went out and started preaching, he went out among the Gentiles. What kind of a people did he uh, run into? Did he run into some real good moral characters? No. What, what did he run into? The worst pagans that you could find. And folks, pagan, the pagan religion is always a filthy, abominable religion. It always ends up that way. Hey, every time you, you follow the pagan religion out to its end, and pagan is not atheist. Don't think pagan is atheist. Atheist is no religion, no God. The pagan religion worships the sun, moon, and stars, and Jupiter, and all the false gods. But every time they had those pagan religions, eventually they'd end up with a temple. And what would they do at that temple? Mr. Bailey, you remember? They would have prostitutes, male and female prostitutes at that temple because they would end up worshiping the queen of heaven or the fertility goddess. Now, you all know every cult that comes along. You, you get a cult and usually what does the leader of that cult generally wind up doing? Sharing the women. Sharing the women. Okay. Now, we know what that man's motivation is. It's purely physical, right? Right. But what he's doing is he's doing the same thing they've been doing for decades and centuries and thousands of years. They would worship the Queen of Heaven and they would worship her through a fertility. To, you know, and look, I don't want to offend anybody with Easter. If you want to celebrate Easter, hey, talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and get on with it. But the roots of Easter is the worship of Ishtar. That's why Easter is celebrated by eggs and bunny rabbits. It's a fertility mm -hmm. thing. And, and it's not something that came from Christianity. I'm not condemning you if you did. I don't mean that at all. Get me an Easter basket. Get me some of them Cadbury eggs. Yeah. 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 But what I mean is, I just want to show you, that's the worship of the Queen of Heaven. And it's still continued today. I mean, look, I was raised to, to worship the Queen of Heaven. I was told to pray to a woman who sits in Heaven making intercession for me. Folks, that woman Mary can't intercede for me and you. Mary needed a Savior. and Thank God Mary's got one. I look forward to meeting Mary. Don't y'all in eternity? But Mary ain't going to be up there glorying in her own works. What's Mary going to be doing? Bowing down before Christ in thanksgiving. Okay, That's what we're talking about. Now, in the case of, of this, uh, the pagans, that's what they did. And that's why they had the, uh, the fertility goddess Diane and all these things they would do. And the temple prostitutes. and it, you, you, you do your own research. Matter of fact, Check into a church steeple where that all comes from and you'll get an idea of what we're talking about. And I don't mean if you go to a church that's got a steeple, you're condemned. I'm just showing you that the pagan religion and its uh, traditions bled into the church, didn't it? Absolutely. And did Constantine mixed the two and 312. 
But what we got here in, in Thessalonica is a perfect picture of Gentiles. So Paul goes out and he tells these Thessalonians that had gotten saved. The chapter 1, verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. He said, hey, you people are, are the gospels going out from Thessalonica. And it's not just in word, it's by deed. People are talking about you. Why? Next verse. For they themselves, their deeds, show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Did they turn from their idols to God? Yeah. But will turning from your idols to God the Father save you? Yeah. What comes next? Next verse. And to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. See, the first step in preaching to an idolater is there, that's not a God. Remember when Paul got to Athens, how he preached to them? He didn't just walk in and preach to the Athenians, Christ crucified, did he? He said, wait a minute, you're worshiping all these false gods. He said, I passed an idol back there that y'all had that said the unknown God. Remember, they had all those different idols they worshiped. He said, that one you call the unknown God, that's the one I want to tell you about because they didn't know God, did they? And he started by showing them there is a creator and only one God. He was trying to turn them from their false gods to the true God in order that he could do what? Preach God gave his son to die for your sins. And that's the natural order, isn't it? So he says here that these Thessalonians, who one day had been worshiping pagans and idols, the next day, here we go, they're, they're turned to God and they're coming into the church. Well, weren't they cursed in their paganism? Yeah. Well, what was required then? Go to Acts 26. Here we've got the commission of the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Paul is the man that God picked to send out there among the nations at the first. And I'll be honest with y'all, I find it almost uh, humorous the way God works at times. I don't mean, uh, I don't believe it. I, I mean, I find it, what's the word? Interesting. I, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a sense of humor to it at times. There's a... And I don't mean that God's sitting up there making jokes. I mean that we humans really think we're something and God will show us just what fools we are. We ain't really make a fool of us. Who is the most racist, segregated, racial person you can find in the book of Acts? Paul. Paul. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Right. Folks, he wouldn't, even, he wouldn't even fellowship with Jews that weren't from his denomination. And what's God do with him? He says, you're going out to the pagans. Now, y'all, you see... You see probably why God allowed him to kill? Because it humbled him, didn't it? And here this man goes out, and this is what God gave him. The Lord Jesus Christ says this to him in verse 15. Paul's retelling the story. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, I know that's a lot, a lot of words there. Let's talk about it. When Jesus Christ appeared to Paul, this is what he said to me. Y'all look closely at it. Verse 16. Acts 26, 16. Rise and stand upon thy feet. Where was Paul at at the time? Face down in the dirt. The Lord knocked him down in the dirt, didn't he? Yeah. He said, For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Now look at that closely. Did the Lord say, Paul, I've come and I sure hope we can reach an agreement. No. <laughs> no. Folks, did the Lord come and say, Paul, I'm here to offer you something and let's see how this is going to go. No. The Lord said, here's what's about to happen. I've told y'all many times, my granny used to tell me we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Which is it going to be? And I knew what that meant. It was going to happen, wasn't it? He said, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. Who's doing the work here, folks? God. God. This is but God. Did anything in Paul's life suggest that Paul was dying to turn over? And, and... Folks, Paul was heading directly to hell and was sure he was going to heaven, wasn't he? And the Lord intervened. But God. 
It says, To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Is he already telling him, I'm going to appear to you more times? Yep, yep. Do y'all see God's foreordained plan? Yeah. He, this is going to happen, isn't it? He said, Deliver me from the people, that's the Jews, and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Can y'all imagine what Saul must have thought at that moment? Going to the Gentiles? Now here's what he's got to do. When he goes to the Gentiles, to open their eyes, then what were they? Blind. Physically? No. Spiritually. How are we all born? Spiritually blind, folks. You can talk about the Word of God to someone and they can understand the stories and they can get some of the morality out of it, but will they ever see that it's talking about Christ? Paul said the natural man can't see it. He says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Now how did the Thessalonians turn from idols unto God? God turned them. God grants repentance. God did it. That's why Paul said we were spiritually dead, but God. Now he says, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan. Doesn't that agree with what he said mm -hmm. in Ephesians? Worshiping the God of this world and we don't even know it, do we? From the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Do you all see the order there? First thing they got to do is turn from their idols to God. And then what happens? Then they can receive the forgiveness of their sins. How's that going to happen? through the preaching of Christ crucified by faith. God's saying, this is what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do the work. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Isn't that wonderful? So how did Ruth get into the congregation of God? Right there. We could read it like this. Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles like Ruth, unto whom now I send thee to people like Ruth, to open the people like Ruth's eyes, to turn the people like Ruth from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that the people like Ruth may receive forgiveness of sins. Now who are the people like Ruth? We are. We are. Folks, we are the Gentiles that have come into the covenant of God. And that's what the book of Ruth is all about. And the book of Ruth, above all things, it points out the story of the kinsman redeemer. And we'll get into this in the next class. This is the bulk of Ruth is all about this term. Under Moses' law, they had all these different ceremonies and ordinances that foreshadowed the work of Christ, didn't they? And if a person had to sell their inheritance, remember God gave the tribes the land and split it up? Were they to sell it and switch? It stayed in their, in their uh, name forever, didn't it? In that family's name. But in order to make sure that that land stayed there, what if a Jew got in trouble and had to sell his land? God made ways that it would be redeemed back. If it couldn't be redeemed back by the year of Jubilee, it would go back. But one of the things that could happen is, if a Jew sold his inheritance... If a Jew sold himself into slavery, if a Jew had wound up in bondage and couldn't get out of it, if a Jew had, had uh, married a woman and the Jew died and had no kids so that now his name was going to disappear, if he's got no male kid, his name's going to go away. Who could step in and do that job for them? A near kinsman. And a near kinsman, <clears throat> according to Moses' law, the kinsman that was near unto him, not immediate kin, near kin, could come in and he could redeem it. He could take the inheritance. He would marry the wife. He would raise up a kid and the kid would have the dead man's name. And this is the story of the kinsman redeemer. And it's what Ruth is all about. Now, we're going to take a break here in a second, but I want you all to just flip back to Ruth and let's read two more verses before we stop. And I, I, Look, I hope and pray that I haven't... Uh, made this confusing by doing it this way. But y'all go to Ruth chapter 2. Next class, it is my intention in, in the next one to go ahead and let's start reading Ruth. Yeah, it's uh, nine books from the front. Go back to the very beginning and when you find uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Thank you. 
Now y'all remember what Ruth is. Ruth is a cursed Moabitess. Can't come into the assembly of the Lord. But Ruth says something here in the book. I just want to show you the two verses that are the main content of Ruth. Ruth 2.10 Then she, Ruth, fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, to Boaz, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Have you ever looked in the mirror and say, why on earth would you save something like me, Lord? Amen. I have that thought all the time. I, I, I sin, I, I do something, and I'm just ashamed of myself, and I sit there and I think, how on earth can God be so gracious? And yet I thank God He is. All I can do is plead His mercy and His love. I said, Folks, I have deserved nothing but... And this is what Ruth's showing us. She said, how can you accept a stranger like me? You know how Boaz did it? Look again what she said. She bowed herself to the ground and said to him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Y'all know what we read about all the saints in the Bible? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you at anything in that statement say that they did anything to obtain it? If you did something to obtain it, it's not grace. So then how do we look at this? How did Ruth get into the family of God? Grace of God. By the grace of God. And grace means unmerited favor. As soon as you say grace, right, stop right there and say, okay, don't look within myself or anything. If it's by grace, don't look to you to figure it out. Hey, me and Mr. Bailey have had this conversation many times because we, we, we think alike where it comes to election. I don't need to spend any time wondering about that person out there. And all, folks, I don't have to do that when it comes to election. All i got to do is look in the mirror and say, there ain't nothing in that joker I'm looking at that deserves saving. Not one thing. Then where do I look for the cause at? There must be some good in me. No, I'm looking in the wrong place. Jesus said, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. God moved. That's why Ruth is in the family of God. What Mr. Bailey said, God picked Ruth, and when the time came, God got Ruth, didn't He? Do you know the providence of God, how He got Ruth? He got a weak in faith, probably an unbelieving Jew, to, to not trust God during a famine and run down to Moab, and then He died, and His two unbelieving sons married Moabites who died. They died, and then the Moabite come. You see what all God did? Folks, God did all of that to do what? To bring one sheep back into the fold. You think he'll lose you if you believe on him? No. no way. Now the next verse says, look at verse 12. Boaz answers, but he says this. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. How did Ruth get saved? By grace through faith in God. Folks, notice it says, Thou art come to trust. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Real quick, flip back to chapter 1 and watch what this Moabitess says. Then we'll take a break. In verse 17, she's talking to Naomi, her mother-in-law. And Naomi says as she's about to leave the land of Moab, she's going home, she tells Ruth, Ruth, you stay here. Stay with your people and have a good life and Ruth won't do it. Ruth says many things to her, but in verse 17 she says, Where thou diest, will I die. I didn't know that. Y'all know that used to be in uh, English marriage vows. They would say that. I didn't know that. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Now this is a Moabite pagan Ruth. And look at the word she just used. The Lord. Everybody look closely at that word Lord. What do you notice about it? The Lord, the Lord is all capitalized. All right. Now, basically, when you read your Old Testament, you will sometimes see Lord written like this. Okay? That just means the, the owner, the head, the master. Okay? Sometimes you'll see God written like this. Folks, that, that's not the name of God. These can refer to God, but they're not the name of God. But when you come to it in the Old Testament, and it's all now the, the first letter will be bigger, but when it's all capitalized like that. Or like this. That tells you that that word has been translated from the Hebrew name for God. It's Jehovah. It's His name. The Jews wouldn't even say it. It's where we got the phrase, the, the Word of God. And what that means is, Ruth just used the Lord's name. Ruth said there, 
Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried, and the Lord, Jehovah, your God, that's going to be my God. Did she turn? No. Yeah. Yeah. Who's turning her? God, don't get the idea that Ruth by her own strength is doing it. Folks, Naomi wouldn't even be there but by the providence of God. Okay? Alright, any questions on that? Okay, well let's take a break.